I got given a pack after, when we left the hospital. Um, uh, Margaret, who was an amazing stroke coordinator, she was fantastic. She gave us a pack which had lots of information on it and I still have that pack sitting in the same spot and every now and then I go and read a couple of things mm. just to remind myself, you know, if I feel a little bit, you know, you know, like if I feel a little bit anxious or um, or memories are coming back for me that I'm not liking, mm. so I'll go back and I'll read something and then I'll go, oh, all right, so if something happens, I just need to do that. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 214 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you're a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience with stroke and you have been thinking about reaching out to be a guest on the show, but we're waiting for the right time to reach out, this is it. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, you'll find a form that you can fill out to apply to be a guest on the show. As soon as I receive it, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you for both of us to meet over Zoom. Now, my guest today is Shelly Christie, who at age 44 experienced an ischemic stroke with two underlying causes, including a PFO, also known as a post foramen ovale, or a hole in the heart, as well as the blood disorder hematoma crosis. Shelley Christie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Another fellow Aussie. We're rare. <laughs> yes, it's good. It's good. Well, it's it good is, to be an Aussie. Yeah, it's good to be an Aussie. It's it's not good that we're rare on the podcast, but that's Correct. all right. We love yeah. everybody. Pros and cons. <laughs> that's it. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Um, so May the 19th, uh, sorry, May the 11th, 2019, I, uh, had a stroke. Um, and then May the 28th had a PFO closure. So that all happened quite quickly. Um, so, but prior to that, I was having, I wanted to see if I could go back because I think we need to look at how what the events had happened. So 2017, I actually had a DVT. Deep and then brain had, thrombosis. Yeah, in my leg after an injury. And then I had PEs on my lungs a week later. And what are they? Was admitted in, uh, clots on my lungs. Okay. So this all started two years prior to the stroke. Um, and I have a iron condition called hemochromatosis. Mm, I've heard so of it. I have iron overload and um, I didn't realise at the time in 2017 that that was a lot of the cause of um, uh, my organs were struggling to work because my iron was really, really high. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that is when your iron uh, is so high, your blood sort of slows down a bit, gets a little bit congealed. And I didn't realise that I was having that issue so so bad and then my blood pressure went up. So that leading up to that, so 2000 and then 2019, um, I had the stroke and um, I had been feeling okay. And after the PEs and the DVTs and all that, I just continued my life as normal, not realising that, you know, it could potentially lead to a stroke. So I, uh, that particular day, I was feeling quite tired. Um, I am not the type of person to go and lie down. So I said to my husband, oh, I'm not feeling that great. I'm just going to lie down. I've got a bit of a headache. I don't normally get headaches. And because we were going out to my girlfriend's daughter's birthday, so I got myself up. We went... Um, we were coming home. We drive. We're like we're driving home, and we're only two minutes around the corner. And I said to my husband, "I'm not feeling well." And he said, "What do you mean?" And I said, "Oh, I'm just. I'm not feeling great." And then he said uh, he couldn't understand what I was saying. 
I do remember getting out of the car and walking into the house. Um, but that's about it, everything after that's a bit of a blur. Um, and I lost all my left side. Um, the next bit I remember was being in recess and uh, at ED and they started to thrombolise. So if it wasn't for my husband and my kids um, noticing my face uh, and calling the ambulance so quickly, um, they got here within five minutes and then they got me into Frankston Hospital. I think it was in, they said it was in like 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I was thrombolised within just under two hours, which really good is awesome. <laughs> um, and then I was in hospital for about four or five days. I couldn't eat or drink for just under 72 hours. Um, I think the worst part about that was when I was wheeled up to the stroke ward because I was so young. And here I am in with... 80 year olds and because I think most people, you know, link stroke to being old mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's just not the case at all. It's, um, you know, the more I talk to people and that it's actually really quite common. And um, that was really confronting, really confronting because I'm like, what am I doing here? Why is this happening to me? And at first, um, one of the neurologists didn't actually see the clot. And it was a young neurologist that came in and said, when I was in a, um, emergency, it was him that said, no, what's that? Apparently, I so saw I got told. And it was him, the young neurologist, that actually said, "I we want to find out why, because you're so young, why this has happened, happened to you. He said, I just want to do one more test. And that's when they, he checked my heart. He said, you know, I don't want you to be concerned. We'll probably find nothing, but we're going to do what we call the bubble test. We're just going to check your heart. He said, you know, sometimes, you know, there might be a hole there or, but, it would, you know, no need to worry. <laughs> and I remember getting wheeled down. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, what is going on? And then they did the bubble test and... You can see it because of the way they like they position you. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they draw some blood out and then they mix your blood with a bit of saline and then they shoot it back in so that the bubbles, it produces bubbles, and then it goes up to your heart and it's not meant to bounce around because you've got your two chamber and then mine's just mine just bounced. <laughs> I'm like, what's that? What said, on earth? Yeah, and... And she said, oh, I'm not meant to say. Oh, I said, oh, I can see it. And I just remember looking at her thinking, and I actually did say to her, that'll be right. Of course. Of course. I've got a hole in my heart. Happy days. <laughs> it's just like I couldn't believe. I, I just, you know, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? Hole in the heart's really common, and it's not um, that serious if they know about it and get it early. Correct. It stands like your, and then I, I've interviewed a whole heap of stroke survivors who've got PFOs and then they've had, uh, it's been revealed because they've had a stroke and then they've been treated for the stroke and then they've also very rapidly been treated for the PFO and they're kind of sorting out the cause of the stroke and that gives That's a right. bit of, uh, that gives a bit of relief and I suppose certainty going forward that that issue is sorted and then they're not going to have um, another stroke because of a PFO. Now, Absolutely. But you're have you, at this stage, you don't know about the hemochromatosis. No, no, I knew I was diagnosed with hemochromatosis ah. at a very young age. But back ah. then, the doctors, you know, they just said, oh, you'll be fine, you're female, you know, mm -hmm. you have your periods, and then you um, just every now and then go and give blood. So that was in my very early 20s. So I didn't have a hematologist. I didn't, I didn't have any of that. They so, underplayed it. Yeah. And I think hemochromatosis is becoming a little bit more common. It's in our family. It's, it's, it's a genetic. So both my parents, I'm a compound, so both my parents are carriers mm. for me to have it. My mum's brother has it. He has it quite 
you know, and he's older. So it's actually really quite serious because it causes – so when iron stores in your organs, um, it can cause heart disease, uh, kidney issues, liver mm. disease, mm. and mm. clots. So how do they manage it? So I'm now under – I go um, and um, I have veni. They call veni sections. So they just take out. They got to take out your blood, and then your high eye, eye disappears. <laughs> it's amazing. But anyway. It is amazing. It's amazing. You know. Do you remember ever hearing somebody talk about the old days at the turn of the last century where they used to do a thing called bloodletting, or yep. they used to like open up a blood well, vessel? That's, that's basically what it is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And is so that I, blood donatable? Any part of that blood donatable? They don't donate mine, but I'm not too sure. Oh, actually, that's a really good question. I'm at, I know they don't mine because um, I go through uh, private, and um, but I do know. I do think now, if you've got hemochromatosis, the Australian blood, blood bank, you can go through as a patient there, uh, and they'll regularly see you. Yep, I believe so, yeah. But I just go under my hematologist. So, I know. so and because my cardiologist is there as well, so I just yeah. do that. So how often do you need to give blood? Um, well, thankfully lately, um, I'm normally about August. I start to feel a bit off. Um, and then I start probably from August once a month through to December. Um, but I've just had my iron levels checked and they're actually really good. So what do you mean? You, this always happened in August. Is it? Yeah. So I tend to have some VD sections. So like for four or five months and then I'm okay for, you know, the rest of the year. Ah, okay. But, but everybody's different. Some people have to have it, you know, every month that their are especially men. Okay. Men have to be real because they don't have periods. So yeah, okay, okay, I see. Right, right, mm. okay, okay. So, so your your nature is supporting it for the majority of the year, but then mm. it gets sort of to the end of the year, and then there's a whole bunch of build up that needs to be resolved by bloodletting a yeah. little more than usual. And I can yeah. generally tell because my joints get sore. Uh-huh. My legs are really sore. And I get really tired. I get more tired on top of the stroke fatigue. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so. Bloody hell, that, that additional fatigue, that's the thing that I suffer from. I've got a thyroid condition, and the thyroid yeah. condition causes the same neurological fatigue yep. as the stroke does. So mm-hmm. I never know whether it's my thyroid or the stroke. Mostly, I think the thyroid is what's affecting me. Mm. And if I'm not on to taking my kelp supplement, which has iodine, Yep. If, I, if I don't take that, especially over winter, um, I do notice that I I experience um, like dramatic fatigue. And I've just gone through a bout of it the last mm. two weeks. Yeah. And it's at that point where when I'm fatigued, honestly, I just cannot do anything. It doesn't matter how much I want to. Nothing is getting done. And I don't even call people or respond to them or anything. I just can't do it. And people take it the wrong way but i apologize later you know when i say look i've been stuffed or i can't deal with uh, what was happening thing, though isn't it you shouldn't have to apologize but we do we do i think i, I agree with we shouldn't have to but they're never going to understand what we're no, going through right. so there's only one uh, way to, for them to understand that and we don't want them to understand yeah. by being in our situation so Absolutely. tell me about tell me about the neurological fatigue from your perspective what does it what's your experience of it like um, so if I, I'm not good and I should know better <laughs> at slowing down. Um, I have two children who play lots of sport and I work. And so when I get very tired, um, I have left side weakness. Mm. I, um, especially my hand, mm. uh, and I can see it in my face. My left eye drops a bit, which has done for a long time, actually. So I spoke to a neurologist about that. But um, uh, 
So I just get so vague. I and I'm, you know, I can be standing there. And I have had actually people say to me, um, oh, we could think you don't like us because you just kind of, you don't really. And I'm like, oh, it's, was that that day? And they'll go, yeah. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm really, I, I'm really particularly tired and I'm very vague. Like I, some days I can't even get words out or my short term memory is really bad. <laughs> But then my long-term memory is come back. It's really bizarre. Um, and I struggle with that. Some days I think I can't speak properly, mm. but I ask people and they're like, no, no, you, you're okay. But I feel like I can't. Oh, my gosh. So, and you look all right for somebody who's had a stroke. Oh, how many times have I heard that? If I had a dollar for every time someone said that to me, <laughs> I'd be rich right now. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag, it's amazing what people say. Hashtag you look great. Um, yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. So in the end, you get vague. So I get, I get cranky. I don't get vague. I get mm. short tempered. Uh, I really actually. Sh- you know what I do too. Yeah. <laughs> when I think about it. Yeah, and then the next couple of days are all the apologies. Who do I have to ring and apologise for being an idiot to? and not yeah. speaking nicely. Yeah. Uh, but I, I explain myself these days and I know it more. I know exactly what happened more, more so. So I'm a little bit, I'm a, a lot better at making it good um, because when I'm cranky and short tempered, oh my gosh, I hate being that way, but I just am because I don't mean it and I'm not trying to be it and I'm not, and I'm trying to not be it, but I just cannot avoid it and I don't know how to mm. stop it. I don't know mm. if it's even possible or if I have the cognitive ability to stop myself before then. Because you know how normally you can learn to stop misbehaving in a certain situation because somebody yeah. says to you, hey, that's not appropriate. And then yeah. you go, oh, okay, you don't do that in this particular situation. Mm. Okay, I won't do that anymore. I can't do that with this cr- yeah, right, okay. cr- crankiness and fatigue. Mm. I've actually got to go through the cycle of being an idiot regret it later yeah apologize a day or two down yeah and that's um it's really difficult um to explain that to people i mm. think you know i think my crankiness is because i'm just exceptionally tired yeah same. all the time all the time i i don't think i've had a day in the last three years where i haven't been tired yep you yeah. know, and, and you know, you just plot along. You, you just keep going. Yeah. Well, I do anyway. I just keep going. And I do that for my kids too, but sometimes I'm my own worst enemy because I don't take time to rest. And I have to admit, COVID was actually quite good for me because no. it, forced, it forced me to rest. Nice, nice. Because here in Victoria, Melbourne, we were one of the most locked down cities in the world. So, and we're, even though I'm on the peninsula, we're classed as regional, they put us in metro. So we were in all the lockdowns. Yeah. So we and, had in the two years leading up to November of 2021, November, December, 2021, yeah. we were locked down for the best part of a year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, mentally, I think uh, looking at statistics and stuff for people who, young stroke patients who, um, depression is huge. Mm. And I know I spiralled quite rapidly, Mm. Um, but I've got, I've had a history. So, you know, I had postnatal after my children and, um, but after that, so when I was going through rehab, um, they also gave me a psychologist because I couldn't understand why this was happening. To you? Yeah. You took yeah. it personally? Yeah. I was like, jeez, oh, you know. And I didn't have, I didn't feel, 
and I, <laughs> I don't want, if anybody listens to this, who knows me, I don't want to offend anyone because I had, I had a small, a really good small network who were really supportive to how they could support. Mm-hmm. Because, like we said, if you haven't been through it, it's really hard to understand. So I, I pretty much after I just kept going. So people would just see me and then like, oh, she's fine. But I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't. It was hard and, um, you know, even for the carers and your family, so my my two girls and my husband, just as hard for them. Mm. And and Mm -hmm. I don't think people, well, I haven't heard it, but I don't think people talk about that a lot. No. At all. The, my wife no. did it really hard. My family members did it really hard, but my wife took the brunt of it because when it happened to me, my kids were teenagers. My two boys were teenagers mm. and they were pricks. They didn't care about anybody about them themselves, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just the, the standard teenage thing. So, and I couldn't explain the condition and I couldn't mm. explain how much I was struggling and how much help I needed. I also couldn't do that with my wife. But she yeah. just, she's kind of like, she's like head down, bum up kind of person. She's just brutally yeah. um, advancing <laughs> the cause, you know, whatever the cause is. Yeah. And at the same time, she's studying. Um, she's gone back to university and studying her um, psychology course. And, oh, then, and then in the same time, her mum passed away. Oh. Um, I've had a stroke. Uh, it was just mental time right and she was doing a tough and i was at counseling so i was doing way better than her from a psychological perspective because i immediately booked myself into a counselor um it had been a habit of mine anyway i'd been doing that since i was 25 so by 37 i had a 12 year relationship with this counselor um but i i wanted to get her into counseling i knew that i was causing harm by being a stroke survivor, uh, mm. inadvertently, and I knew that she was lacking the resources because she went from a mum to being a mum and a human and herself and you know all the things that she identified as to a caregiver of a stroke survivor of her mm. neurological patient. Yeah. Uh, there's no support. There was no book that she was given. There was no call these numbers if you need them. There was nothing. There was just go home and you know, he'll be right. And man, I wasn't right. I was hallucinating. I was having episodes where I thought maybe this is happening again. Um, Mm -hmm. So we were always worried and panicked. Um, We were anxious. Uh, The amount of times I went back to hospital and did, I'm not sure if I'm having another stroke, you know, that, that routine. My God, that was so many of those times she would have to drive me in all hours and drop everything. Um, and she had no support. So yeah. I hear, I hear what you're saying. Your your girl is how how young were they? Uh, so I've got two daughters. Um, Kayla was uh, now I've got to try and remember. She was seven and a half, mm. and Kendall was six. So little. So little. Very little. And you know, they they still suffer. mm Hmm. Especially my youngest, she, she, you can see it in her. She has the worry that I have: is this going to happen again? And is next time I am I going to die? Wow! Right, I can see that in her. Yeah. When she, like, if I say, "Oh God, I've got a headache," and you see the look on her face, it's mm. like, "Oh," and I just go, "Oh no, no, it's all right." But how do you explain that to children? Even your partner or your husband or your wife mm-hmm. or, you know, I mean, it's always in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, even on the day of the PFO, the heart surgery, mm. I'll try and say this without tearing up because I tear up. And that's another thing. I get very teary. Mm-hmm. I, I hear that a lot from stroke survivors. Pseudobulbar affect. Oh, really? Well, that's yeah. something I didn't know. You need to Google that. Yeah, right. The pseudobulbar affect. It's a condition that... Oh impacts your emotions, uh, mm. the emotion sense of your brain, and it makes you cry over the kitty cat tripping over. 
I'm, I'm shocking. If somebody says to me, because I've done a lot of work on myself since then, so mm. the stroke isn't, uh, I don't see it as time goes on, I don't see it as such a negative thing. I actually, um, I've done a lot of growth for myself, mm -hmm. um, which is good. Personal growth is amazing. Absolutely. That's when I started. Absolutely. I started at 37. Yeah, I've got rid of, oh, that sounds awful. I got rid of, I've chosen to have boundaries um, and certain people aren't in my life anymore. And that's, you know, can be sad, but at the same time, it's good for me because they used to make me feel like I was the issue. Yes. I actually well had somebody say to me, um, and she's being very honest, and I, I, I really respect honesty. Mm. Um, and <laughs> she actually said, oh, you know, just, uh, you know, it was after the stroke, and she said, uh, you know, a few people think that your mental health issues are an issue. And I, from that day on, I was like, oh, okay, I can understand that. Yeah, I can see. I can, you know, I appreciate that. But, um, you know, maybe time to move on. Yeah, it sounds like she <laughs> was saying that on her own behalf, not yeah, yeah, representing yeah. other people. Hot kettle. Yeah. Kettle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, move on. But my kids, my kids, yeah, I, I talk to a girlfriend a lot and it's amazing how you find – your tribe mm. through trauma. So I have actually found um, a really good friend who has been through a different journey of cancer at the same time in, in 2019, but we call it the same, but it's different. Yeah. It, it was a different experience, but it's the same. We get it. We yep. understand when we speak the pressure you have of um, feeling like, oh, what, what if this is going to happen again? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we... and that's what I'm saying. Like with my kids on their morning of the PFO, mm. I and on the anniversary every year, mm. you know, I think about on the way to the hospital, I text three people three friends who I, I love dearly and I, the same message, and I said, hey, just on my way to get this heart fixed, do you think if something happens, can you help Craig raise the girls? And it was just, I, 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 honestly, I didn't know if I was going to come home that day. And I know that people think, oh, dramatic, dramatic, but it's not. It's, it's really tough. Absolutely, it's not dramatic. I I did that. I had to go into brain surgery. Yep. So uh, a week before that, we had buried my mother-in-law. Yeah, right. And yeah. I was going into brain surgery. So death was possible and um, all Absolutely. sorts of other dramas were possible. We, di we didn't know what they were. I pretended like it wasn't going to be a thing, like everything was going to be fine, catch you on the other side. But I didn't really truly feel 100% confident in that outcome. I made good with as many people as I could before I went into surgery because I knew that that might not be, it might, might not have an opportunity mm. to do it again. And mm -hmm. my kids explaining that to them and them pretending being, you know, the Aussie blokes that they are pretending that everything was okay. And yeah, she'll be right. Dad, see on the other side, you yeah. know, I, I read through that. I saw right through that, but they did what, they could do the best they could do to Absolutely. feel to feel like they were supporting me. Um, and the people that I've spoken to, you know, I call the podcast the Recovery After Stroke podcast. But you, if you just remove stroke and replace it with any condition, heart, mm -hmm. cancer, whatever, child loss, we're all recovering from something. The only reason why I call it Recovery After Stroke is because that's the people who relate to me specifically yeah. – had a stroke and vice versa, and I and I relate to them. So mm. it's it works, you know. It's niched, but trauma is trauma, regardless mm. of how it comes. When we learn that we are mortal, then shit gets real, and yeah. that's yep. what happened to me. You know, I had yep. three bleeds, so 
I, I, it was fair enough that I had the whole will it happen again routine come up, you know, and I had to get really good at paying attention to my body and taking action. Mm -hmm. And instead of being, um, feeling like I, I had no control in the matter, I started my personal development course, you know, I say course, my personal development, um, uh, started and, and then I became responsible for everything that I could control yeah. in that journey. And if it ended badly, well, I did the best I could. Mm. And hopefully I'm a good example for how you need to tackle these things. And maybe people will learn from my example and I will have left a great, um, like a great legacy, so to speak. But, yeah, that's right. But there was no... There was no way to sugarcoat it. It was the first time in 37 years where I actually realized that, hang on a sec, we're not here forever and it could happen any time, you know. So, yeah, it's tough. So, you're early on and I'm 10 years out all up, right? Mm -hmm. So, I've done a lot of these conversations and I think I've kind of settled the trauma a lot because – because by speaking about it so much, it's become a bit of a memory rather mm -hmm. than I'm not reliving really all those experiences. They're kind of like in the past. Do you feel yeah. that your anniversary is making you relive certain things? If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com, and download the guide. It's free. Absolutely, because I don't think that I've really, um, really looked at it and, de and dealt with it in a way that I can look at it as each anniversary comes on as um, a full celebration because I am very grateful uh, for my husband and my daughters for getting and helping me get to the hospital very quickly because if they didn't, it could have mm. been a different story. So I think about all that, but when it comes to the anniversaries, it's um, because it's always Mother's Day, right? So the, on the Saturday and the Sunday was Mother's Day. So it's always, you know, and it's and the and and the kids don't know what to do. Husband doesn't want to do. You know, do we celebrate? Do we not celebrate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, but as time goes on, it changes. Mm -hmm. um, and I just need to learn to accept the changes that have happened with me physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as time goes on, um, I don't want to forget it as such, mm. as it, you know, because yeah. I think you need to have, I think you need to have it there to appreciate the growth because I have done a lot of growth and, um, you know, and some of it was well needed. Um, and I, I think that as time goes on, I just get more proud of what I have achieved because three months after that, <laughs> much to my husband's dismay, I called him one day and I said, oh, by the way, I've just registered for soccer. He goes, pardon? <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah, I did. Go soccer mum's program. And he's like, um, really? And I'm like, yep. And I went 
It was very, and I learned that I couldn't run backwards. I learned all this stuff that I could and couldn't do anymore. And that's confronting. Yeah. So as the anniversaries come along, I, I kind of go, oh, yeah, look how far I've come. Okay, I can't play soccer anymore. I can't run um, the way I used to. Yeah. And soccer was not something that I did all the time, but it was lovely to kick a ball on the ground and just push it along and whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's not going to. That's not possible. So I've taken up uh, riding an electric bike, like an e-bike. Oh, yeah. Yep. And that's really, really amazing because that gives me that sense of adventure and freedom yeah, that I used good. to experience. And it doesn't make my left leg go tired because it has mechanical motorized support with yep. the pedaling at the beginning. Yep. And, it, and it supports you until 25 kilometers an hour. Yeah. So you're hardly breaking up a sweat, you know, yep. when you're pedaling. But you're still out there. That's yeah, the thing. And I think yeah. that's the key for survivors is that, um, you know, if you've got, if you've if you've had the support, the mental health support, um, I think that's a big key mm. to to getting over that barrier of the change that's happened, yeah. and um, and. You know, the losses that you've had, it can be friendships, family, it can be, you know, your cognitive, it can be you're still grieving for the change in yourself. Mm -hmm. But then when you have the support that you, when you notice all that kind of stuff, you know, there's so much more out there mm -hmm. that you can do. Mm -hmm. And and I think if us as survivors and that we we talk about it more, it's, it's really important because I don't, I haven't really talked about it. Mm -hmm. Until now, yeah, I think it's you know it for the journey for me. I think it's um, you know I, I'm starting to connect because uh, I, I disconnected from the stroke community because I, I I often got told you know oh you've recovered so well look at you you know yeah. like you know um, so I just started telling myself oh well I won't I'll I'll just even though I've had a stroke, I'll, I'll just leave that there and I'll, I'll just, well, I don't want to talk about it. Who wants to talk, who wants to talk about it? Yeah. I don't think a lot of people want to talk about it. Um, that's no. to be honest. So, you know what I do? I choose the people that I can talk about it. So last Friday I had a catch up with a guy called Antonio and Antonio was a guest on my podcast. He's a Melbourneian yeah. and he, he was a guest on my podcast really early on. Yeah. And um, he, he was overseas when he had his stroke uh, in, I think, Thailand or something like that. Oh, wow. And um, I'm just checking to see what episode he was on so people who want to listen to it can. Uh, he was on episode 29, and he had a brainstem stroke as well, right? Mm -hmm. And we catch up once a year, or over COVID we didn't, but we catch mm -hmm. up once a year. So we went and had a, a catch up, and we talked about stuff and some stroke stuff related to other things passions that he ha that we have mm. so he was a musician he used to play guitar he can't play it anymore so now he's swapped to one-handed piano oh, and wow. then yeah he's become a music producer uh, so he produces his own stuff and some other people's stuff so you know he's keeping active he's about 10 years out as well if not a bit more um, so things do kind of change and settle down but he still experiences fatigue and he still has mm. um, a left side uh I think right side deficits. So he walks with a limp and his arm doesn't work a hundred percent. But we, we go about, we go about sort of becoming normal, whatever that means. And then applying that to what we live with, which is all of the aftermath of our strokes. Um, so he's done that. So we got together for an hour. We, sp we spoke about, um, fatigue, stroke, all that kind of stuff. And then we spoke about what we love. Um, yeah. So it kind of kind of works. But when I meet with other people who are not like Antonio or yourself, we speak about other stuff that are mm -hmm. not stroke-related because they don't know how to interact with that part of the conversation. Yeah. And they haven't got an experience yet. So thankfully, we don't. they can't relate. So that's really good. But- it is those really cool people who I discovered 
after my strokes as well, who were the ones that came out of nowhere, who surprised me. Yeah, I had and, a couple of those. Yeah. I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Yeah. I didn't expect cool you to you? come back into my life or yeah. come into my life. Yeah. Um, you know, love it. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 fascinating journey on what happens with who, what, when, um, how people handle it because mm. some don't handle it very well at mm. all. Mm. Um, and that's okay because yeah. that, you know, that it's okay um, because it is confronting. Mm. Um, but it is, it is a really interesting journey to go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, look, it, I've got to the point where I'm writing a book that's called Strokes, the Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. Mm. And I know that is not for everybody. I get it. Mm. And this is not yeah. about I had a fantastic time having a stroke. It's not about that. Yeah. It, it's all about the personal growth yes. that happened. Yep. And if you think about, again, I look all good, you know, I look fine. Um, but if you think about the people who have had amazing personal growth uh from their conditions, just look at the Paralympics. Yep. Those guys would never say, oh, yeah, I'd love not being able to walk again or move my arms or what yep. my leg or whatever, but they're playing basketball wheelchair and they're winning gold medals. Yep. Um, so there's no doubt about it that they would not have been playing basketball wheelchair if they didn't have uh, the trauma that caused them to be in that situation. Mm. So the trauma is not the part that they uh, would love, but they definitely love the opportunity to receive a gold medal at an Olympics as a result yeah. of the fact that they've chosen to turn a shit situation into the most positive situation they can. And yeah. it paid off in massive dividends. It mm. paid off because they got to travel the globe, represent yeah. the country, meet people that are like-minded and going through similar things, yeah. um, uh, but perform at the highest level in their uh, in their sport, in their field. So it's like, hmm, okay. I, I don't think I would give it back. I'd love to learn from – I'd love to have these learnings without the trauma, but I don't think it's possible for me personally to have this kind of learning without that kind of trauma. I oh, wasn't. I wasn't that wise. And I'm the same. If it didn't happen to me – uh, I wouldn't have learned a lot about myself mm. or others around me as well going mm. through the growth. Um, you know, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. Um, I certainly have, you know, pissed people off in the past and because I'm very honest, <laughs> a bit too honest sometimes, I think. Brutally I honest. Sometimes. Um, and I have to, um, and I've, through the growth, I've, I've changed. And I even have to, the way I think because of how my brain works now is I, because I could be in mid-sentence and I could be like, what was that? What was that? You know. Yep. So they're the kind of things that I am very grateful for even though I had the stroke because you're right, you can't, you can't have something like that happen and not learn from it and, and change and you've got to accept the change that comes mm -hmm. because I don't, if you don't, I think that's when you really struggle mentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, just lost my thing. So. <laughs> um, I know in the last couple of months that I have been so busy that I can feel the fatigue, it's it's coming, it's hit, it's going to hit me like a, a, a truck. Mm. I, I can feel it. Um, uh, husband's been away a lot. Kids have got sport. I'm doing soccer. I'm now working for Football Victoria, which I'm really happy about. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to schools and coach. We're trying to do the participation for schools. And... Um, but that hasn't come with 
you know, some days are hard, but that kind of growth, and I don't think I'd be here, like, you know, doing all this stuff um, if I didn't choose to, like, go with the change that came from the trauma. Yeah. And you learn from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, I wouldn't have been doing the podcast or any of the stuff that I've done that's related to stroke. I wouldn't be writing a book. Uh, I had no idea what a book yeah. might be about or how to That's string so one together or who helps yeah. for that. Like, it's just completely different. It's just a different version yeah. of me that I, I really love. And I kind of, I get a little bit, well, you know, I'll, I'll use the word jealous for lack of a better word. I get a little mm. bit jealous that there's other people that have written books already and <laughs> and for them, Maybe that it's it's been easier, or they got paid to write a book, or all this stuff. It's like, hmm, okay, well, I'm just going to bloody write one, and I don't yeah. know whether anyone's ever going to pay me to write one or not. But maybe they'll pay me to read one, uh, yeah. and that's all right. Uh, but that's, good, that's been so hard. That's mm. that's been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is write a book uh, because I've started it in lockdown, one of our many lockdowns. I don't know which one. <sighs> And it's been more than a year now, and I'm up to chapter seven of 10. And it's so hard to focus and concentrate and get the words out of my mind and put them onto a page. And it's, and my book coach, yeah. she's been um, coaxing me along and managing me and all that kind of stuff. And she reached out two weeks ago so we can have a catch up on Zoom because we have a, a monthly catch up. And I didn't even email her back for two weeks because I had so much trauma and fatigue and trouble mm. getting back to people about stuff. This is that phase that I was going through. And I just said to, I just sent to her an email yesterday because she sent me another one going, hello, hello, where are you? And I said, look, been really fatigued, whatever, struggling at the moment, but I made an appointment yeah. for two weeks time to catch up with her. So, yeah. um, it's really rewarding and it's going to be great when I've done it. And I've had this idea in my mind that I'm going to write another one, but I don't yeah, think I've got it good. in me. I, I, don't, I don't think I've yeah. got it in me to write another one. But, you know, you just, you know, I've, I hear a lot of um, you only live once. Mm, like, mm. you know, you got to live your life. Mm. And, and it's true. It is true. Um, but sometimes... You know, if you want to do it, you just got to do it. Mm, mm. If you want to do your second book, you'll do it. Yeah, I'm going to finish. I wish this I could one. read a book. Well, I, I could. That's one thing I can't do anymore. Is I I really struggle. I you know because I'm so tired, and generally mm. you hop in bed at night and you're reading a book, right? Yeah. I can probably only do one to two pages. Yeah. And that's about it. I'm still that. I'm still that way. I was the same. Yeah. If I don't read in the morning, there's no way I'm reading at night. No chance. Yeah. 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 And I, I do really miss that. Audio you know. books? Have you jumped onto the audio books? Um, I have done a couple, but I fall asleep so quickly. Yeah. I just go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I listen to them when I'm doing long drives. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I get a topic like, you know, at the moment I'm listening to, um, um, the the Socratic dialogues. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a it's a conversation that was had two thousand or two and a half thousand years ago by the Greek philosopher Socrates, and it's in it's um he's talking to another person about the way that thing that they interpret things and what does things do things really mean and they go into these really deep levels of yeah but if this and it's an ethics. It's about ethics, right? So if this is that, well, then what about that? And then, then, and then, and they keep going. And it's a really aw- awesome conversation to listen to that I could never concentrate enough to to read. And that's the reason why I'm I'm listening to such crazy titles, yeah, because I could never read them. Whereas now I can listen to listen it to and it, yeah. I get the gist of what the book's about and how I can apply that to my life. Like they are the the the. It's because it's deep thinking, mm. not just um, making a judgment of about something at the f- 
base level and then leaving it at that and then sticking with that. No, but if you yeah. investigate deeper and deeper, and that's what I think personal development has been for me. I've mm. I've learned that uh, I, I identify as this guy who has um, a need to say things. All right. I have, I've always had a need to express myself, but I haven't allowed me, myself to. I have put it yeah. back because I was afraid of criticism. I was afraid of being told I'm wrong or you can't say that or this or that mm. or whatever. Mm. Whereas now um, I'm on a podcast. So I've gone from having a voice and not expressing it to having a voice and expressing it. And now how I'm expressing it is what I'm interested in is how deeply am I going to go into some of those conversations? Am I going to have them just at a face level? Do I want to hear yeah. from my my guests like you and say, all right, what happened to you? Oh, you had a stroke. All right, what else? Uh, this happened, that happened. Well, that's a pretty boring. Well, let's go deeper into the emotional, into the psychological, yeah. you know, into the physical and, and see how that conversation um, has way more layers to it than just what happened at the surface. And that's how I run my life with other people. I very rarely talk to people about the football. Ah, wow, well, great day, great, great week at the football, you know, and that player this and that player that. I'm not interested in that kind of talk for too long. I love deep, meaningful conversations with the people yeah. that I hang out with. And yeah, open person. And, you know, yeah. I'm I'm very much like that. And I think that can be sometimes perceived or actually quite confronting for mm -hmm. some because you know sometimes when you're an open person and you're honest it can actually trigger the other person the other person without you even realizing mm. that you're triggering them and they might not just they just might go no not especially when they say how are you and you tell them i'm yeah. shit <laughs> i'm shit today oh god i'm really tired yeah yeah, and then you sort of like sometimes I think, oh, God, why did I say that? Like, you know, then they're just going to think I'm just so like whinging all the time or I'm just so dramatic or, um, mm. you know, or, you know, oh, I'm lying or – but it's not the case at all. It's just, you know. The truth. <laughs> it's the truth. And, you know, I think more people who talk about stroke survivors and, and – um, what we've every because everyone's different and experience things differently, have different support levels. Um, you know, I think the more we talk about the mental health side of it, and you know, things like Enable Me from Stroke Foundation and all that mm. kind of stuff. Like, I think, see, I haven't engaged in that very much. I don't. I still don't know why. I can't answer that question to myself. Mm. Like I, I reach and then I pull back. Mm. Then I reach out and then I pull back. Like I'm really surprised that I'm on this today, but I think I'm ready mm. to have a voice what's to help help people, what, others. Help what's surprising them. about it? What what makes you think you might not have made it here? Um, because I've. Since the stroke and the heart surgery, I've kind of got the feeling that nobody really wanted to talk about it. Except me. Yes, have you. A couple of people have, but I, that's my interpretation. Yeah. Well, here we go again. Yeah. yeah. Or, or we don't, you know, I don't want to hear that. You, you do have to choose your audience. Yeah. 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 I, I yeah. don't speak about it to everybody. And some people I avoid speaking about it. The downers, the Debbie downers, I try and avoid them. And the people who, um, and the people who have heard about it the most are my wife and my family and my kids. So I don't do them the stroke thing forever yeah. and a day. I don't do that to them. Yeah, we uh, don't either, actually. We yeah. don't think about it. We don't talk about it. In fact, oh, you know, I was talking about my youngest. You know, she she does. I can see it in her. She does stuff up, but. Oh, I'm going to try not to cry with this one. Um, they just recently had to do um, a presentation on somebody they admire, and it could have been a sports person, a movie star, could have been anybody they wanted, and she did me. <laughs> I'm like looking at her and thinking, what? what? And then her first line was, my mum's a stroke survivor. Wow. 
And deep, she plays soccer. Deep thinker, that one. Oh, she is. Yeah, she's very much like me. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, really? You don't want to do anybody else? She's like, no, no. Because mm. I go, but why? She goes, because you just keep going, Mum. And I'm like, she goes, look what you're doing. And I'm like, oh. So that was a couple of weeks ago. I think that was a trigger for me. Yeah. To go, right, okay. If my 11-year-old can see that I'm doing, you know, really well, I should speak more about it. Oh, uh, I think and you help others. Yeah, yeah. You should speak about it in the context that yeah. uh, you're overcoming, you're moving on regardless, you're learning, you're having yeah. growth, you know, in that mm-hmm. context, yeah. If yeah, if we're if the conversation is all or oh, which it needs to be still, you still need to be honest and say, I am struggling today or I mm. can't deal with this or whatever. And then but I'm learning, I'm trying, I am you know, I'm listening to my body, et cetera, mm-hmm. then it's a better thing because you're giving an example of how to deal with the highs and lows yeah. and, and how to overcome it. If you're just, if I was just going to my wife and saying, can't feel my leg all day, every day, why can't I feel my leg? Yeah. You know, she, she's gonna, eventually going to get sick of it, but I can't feel my leg all the time. And yeah. it's like, well, okay, whatever. I can't feel it anymore. I just keep going. Yeah. Um, I feel it in a weird way that's different from my other side, but I still feel it. So I'm like, I still feel it. Okay. It's all good. Mm. No worries. Um, I I reckon what I did is I took my kids to therapy with me and my wife, everybody went to counseling with me and we addressed the elephant in the room. We haven't done that all together. The kids go, I went, uh, husband. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. No, nah, he was, he's, he, you know, brought off on a farm. And, yeah. you know. he, he might cry in front of everybody. He doesn't want anyone Your to Your emotions see him cry. aren't, um, you know, yeah. that well received sometimes. But, you know, he he's he's been my biggest supporter. Yeah. He should be really proud of himself because he didn't get a lot of support from his mates. No. In fact, he got stuff all, to be honest. No. There was one maybe or two mm. but didn't really. So he kind of just went through it himself mm. Mm. for a bit there. My auntie and uncle were great, um, you know, but they did, they don't live near us. So that was, you know, um, but, yeah, I, th- I think that's a really good idea that, you know, people should as a family talk about it. Yeah. And I, I sucked them in at the beginning. I said, Come, come for a drive with me, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go see my friend, my friend Patricia, and and then she'd be like, "Hey, everyone!" And we're like, hmm, "What's this?" I gave him yeah, a bit more information. Yeah, I gave him a bit more information than that, you know. But yeah, I, yeah. I made it as low key as possible so that I wouldn't make a big deal out of it. Mm. And then we just turned up, and they were asked to stay outside initially. Um, can you guys just hang out for a little bit in the waiting yeah. room, whatever? And then it was like. Hey, can you come in here for a sec? I want to ask you something. Yeah. And it was kind of done like that. So we had uh, we had a really cool uh, way of making a part of conversation and addressing it informally, even though we were at a formal place. Yeah. And what I did with my wife was like, I'd like you to be there so I can say a few things to you under supervision. Mm. And it was more about me not her saying things to me. Yeah. But then my counsellor was definitely going after her for a little bit, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we got a lot out of that. That really made a big difference. And as a result, when my kids became teenagers, they would say, can I go and see the counsellor on my own? And I was like, I was thrilled because that meant that now they had a tool that I never had growing up which was when things are feeling tough or you don't know a way out or something, go go get counselling and go get a support. Absolutely. And, you know, I, um, and I'll keep going back to it time and time again, you know, the mental health is mm. a key part of recovery. 
a huge part, you know, um, if you don't look after that, it's, it's just, you're just not going to recover. It's one third of the recovery. I mean, absolutely. Emotional is a third, physical is a third, and yeah. psychological is a third. And without yeah. one of those, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Um, yeah. Mental, mental health and, co- and counseling for your mental health is supporting the emotional health. So that's a real mm. good loop that occurs. Then you can do other emotional uh, intelligence. Uh, courses and discover things about your heart, et cetera, that help you to advance your mental health. You know, there's a loop mm-hmm. there. And, of course, physical health feeds into both of those and they all feed into physical health. So it's really important because they all become uh, – uh, they're all interconnected. You know, it's that holistic approach yeah. when you're handling all of them. Yeah. Um, and I think at an, at the emotional stage, you're also dealing with spiritual. So if, you, if people are listening and not relating, but then – they understand spiritual recovery, whether that's religion or whether that's something else, that's done at the emotional stage. That's kind of where that sits, sits in your heart. You know, it's not something yeah. that you do in your head. Yeah. Um, but getting your thoughts um, rearranged and sorted out into a direction that's supporting your life going forward is much better than having it muddled up and being continuing going down a path that you're not happy with Absolutely. that you've never been happy with yeah. that has got you negativity and difficulties in life so you can mm. adjust that you just have to relearn that's a new right. way to go about things that are yeah. supportive and that's like, like like i just said before you know last couple of months i've real i'm starting to you know because i've been so busy so the focus on keeping well and and you know fuel your body right and um all that kind of stuff uh and getting some good sleep however we do have a 13 week old puppy Mm -hmm. uh so i'm not getting much sleep (laughs) but um you know doing all that kind of stuff is you know really really important and that's what my girls are learning through going through counseling yeah. And, and yeah, so they the, their tools are their mindfulness tools are really good. Um, you know, wish I had that as a kid, mm. but you know, however, I have it now, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but that's if I can say to anybody, if anyone's you know who wants to listen to this, you know, as a survivor, you if you get on top of the mental, you can. You know the physical stuff with rehab and everything. You can um, just keep going. Yeah, the mindfulness is a really good one. I think yeah. mindfulness has become this thing. You know that's just really marketed really well, and people do. But uh, what? Just in case people don't understand what mindfulness does, like what it does for me, how I use it is it keeps me in the today, in the now, in this yeah. moment. So with you, rather than thinking about the part the the past. And therefore, mm-hmm. the past being dredging up the traumas and all that stuff. Right now, I'm enjoying the moment. Yeah. When I need to deal with the past, I'll be in counselling. Yeah. And while I am not going to counselling, I'm making note of the things I need to be aware of from my past so I can speak in counselling about it. Yeah. So I can heal the trauma. Now, going forward, where I'm worried about the future, that's anxiety. That's worried about something that hasn't happened yet. And yeah. it's robbing my life from being enjoy from having enjoyment in this moment right now with you and, and having a lovely conversation. Mm. So again, when I come up with something that I might worry about in the future that is n- that I don't have proof for, um, even though I have a previous example of it, I'm not necessarily there's no real proof that it will happen again. Um, I make a note of that again, and I stop worrying about it for this moment and I'm going to take yeah. that into counseling and I'm going to talk about it in counseling. Mm-hmm. So my mindfulness is going I'm right here right now. I'm safe. I've got a roof over my head. Everything's okay. Yeah. And uh, there's no need to think about the past or worry about the future right now. Mm-hmm. I'll do mm-hmm. this right now. So the writing it down and the um, using it as kind of discussion points or automatically takes it out of your head. Yes. 
That's so put, true. I had to do that yesterday. It. Yeah, right. I had a journal for a while and um, mm, I was mm. actually coming back from working down at Phillip Island and I was coming back and I listened to one of your podcasts and oh, I wish I could remember the lady's name. It was just a recent one. And she was speaking about her stre- and the PFO closure and mm. she was talking about um, how she felt having the surgery and after because you asked her, you know, what, is there any side effects from the PFO? Blah, blah. And while I was driving, listening to this, I got triggered because it brought back mm. the heart surgery. Mm. So, because I had the heart surgery 17 days after the stroke. Mm. So I, you know, and here's the thing, this is, you know, all the mindfulness that you can do. And yesterday I had to, um, I'm driving along and I'm like, whoa, I'm feeling really hot. <laughs> I could feel because she was describing how it happens and I'm like, yep, that's, yep, yep. So, you know, after a PFO, after a heart surgery PFO, you have to lie down to six to eight hours mm. straight. You can't move basically. And when I stood up, they got me up, all the blood come out because I'd had so many blood thinners. Mm. And I was just, and it was all just everywhere. And I, I thought about that. And then I thought about the feeling in my heart days after that, like I could feel it. In fact, I had a heart monitor on two weeks ago because I'm still having fast heartbeats. Mm. In fact, some nights it wakes me up like I, somebody's got a paddle. Oof. You know, they're the things, mm-hmm. you know, that you've mindfulness, you, if you learn the tools, you can help you take deep breaths and go, oh, yeah, okay, yes, that happened. Um, mm. You know, I'll think about it. But, yeah, that would that happened yesterday. Wow. I was like, oh, I actually thought, didn't think that that would happen again, but it did. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> realise how m- triggering some of these episodes could be for people because I don't often get triggered by anything anymore that's related mm-hmm. to this because I've done a lot of work and, I do from time to time have a cry on a po- on the podcast and all that. Mm. So yeah, it is amazing how how much other people's stories you can relate to because you listen to it and it's your exact symptoms or situation mm. or whatever. And then that just shows that that's where the work is that you need to do. That's absolutely exactly that trigger is where the work is because if you're not being triggered then that's kind of been an experience you've had and it's you've resolved it with yourself somehow. Yeah. Yeah. But when it is a trigger, that means that it's unresolved and needs to be dealt with somehow. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, some people think that triggers are, are negative, but I think it's some as time goes on, I think they're positives because you, it, it, you have to learn to deal with that trigger. Mm. Otherwise, you can't you can't move on. Sometimes, yeah, they're and a positive from the perspective that they're information, and you need to absolutely take that information and do something mm. with it in a positive direction. Mm. But if you're being triggered by everything and you're expecting other people to change around mm. you because okay. you know you're uh, you're too sensitive, well, you're getting it wrong. The trigger war- That's why I don't like. I've put a couple of trigger warnings on a few of my episodes, but I don't like trigger warnings because mm. how many can I possibly have and how do you I know? You probably have a trigger warning for every episode, yeah. to be honest, like because yeah. there's always going to be somebody listening to it and, yeah. and they're going to get triggered. Yeah. Because – and they might not even realise. Yeah. You know, at the time, they might go, oh, jeez, oh, I don't know what that meant. But, yeah. yeah, but you're right. You can't put it on everything. Like, no. And if you get triggered, that's where the work is. That's all. It's time mm. for you to step up, um, mm. grow up, become an adult, mm. and mm. discover how to get through it and overcome it. Mm. I mean, I get triggered by lots of things as well, but um, they're not as effective in debilitating me and making me a smaller version of myself anymore. They're not. They don't do mm. that anymore. They're just a mm. reminder. Okay, more work needs to be done here. You know, and um, I address that some way shape or form whether i read about it or whether i go to counseling about it or whether i youtube about it you know something like that it 
Yeah. They, they all help because I like to get curious about why I'm being triggered. So what is it? Is it this? Is it that? Is it whatever? Once I understand it and then I can address it in the context of, well, um, the trigger is related to this, this, and that. And I no longer need to be triggered by being teased because I'm not a child anymore and teasing doesn't really mean anything. And that mm. was relevant when I was seven or eight. Yeah. And it's not relevant now, so I don't really mind what people call me. It's their problem, not mine. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really kind of basic example, but that's no longer triggers me. That mm. was relevant in 1985. It's not relevant mm. anymore. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, too, uh, you know, I, I got given a pack after, when we left the hospital um uh margaret who was an amazing stroke coordinator she was fantastic she gave us a pack which had lots of information on it and i still have that pack sitting in the same spot and every now and then i go and read a couple of things mm. just to remind myself you know if i feel a little bit you know you know, like if I feel a little bit anxious or um, or memories are coming back for me that I'm not liking. Mm. So I'll go back and I'll read something and then I'll go, oh, right, so if something happens, I just need to do that. And that's how I deal with that sometimes. Yeah, so if you're everybody, no, Nobody knows that <laughs> and everyone knows it now. <laughs> not even my well, husband knows that. <laughs> whoever listens, yeah. I get it. Uh, yeah. Your yeah, you've got like a you've got a process in place. You've got something that empowers you, instead of feeling like you're always at the whim of this thing, whatever it is. No, you've actually got a bit of control that you've taken yeah. back, yeah. and it allows you to uh, calm the nervous system and breathe mm -hmm. and go. Okay, no, no, I have got a plan for that. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. and I and I, you know, I wish when people um there were lots of margarets around who i had at frankston hospital she was amazing and i i really wish that everybody who gets discharged gets given the information that i got given and even just her her presence um because she uh, explained things really well and she said, and I'll never forget it, she actually sat me down and she said, this is going to be really tough for you once you walk out this door. And I said, okay. And she goes, no, this is going to be really tough for you. She said, but it will be okay if you use the tools. Wow. And I don't think all that, I don't think, if she hadn't have said that to me, I don't think, I think I would have walked out there going, oh, you know, oh, I've, you know, I'm looking good, got my left side back, happy days. Because I always had it in the back of my mind, oh, God, this is going to be tough because she said it. Mm. But I don't think if she had, if she hadn't have said that, I would have just, it would have, I would have been worse. Yeah, your, your because, expectations don't get yeah. met and then it's, well, yeah. you're going through it again. I, I thought yeah. by now this and I thought by now that and yeah. none of this has come and what does that mean? Yeah. She actually also said, <laughs> um, she said your relationships are going to struggle, your, um, you're going to struggle, your kids are going to struggle. She said it, and she was just so raw and honest. And I just, uh, every year I send a box of chocolates to the ward. I don't even know if she's still there and she gets them. <laughs> but I still send them because I just like, makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully if she's still there, she's feel, feel, she feels good and the nurses. But, um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think if we had all a lot of Margaret's, I think um, it would be better for the survivors. 
They're rare breed. They're a rare breed, the Margarets. They definitely the Margarets. are. Yeah, they are. I know what you mean. The compassion that some people show is just yeah. they're so good at it. It's next level and uh, it catches you by surprise and then it really uh, impacts you and makes you, rem- you know, and allows you to remember that. I, I know yeah. that I had a nurse who um, was just being a nurse, but in the middle of the night when my temperature was through the roof, you know, he was stripping me off and he was um, uh, covering my body with ice, you know, like completely frantic uh, to make sure that my body temperature was coming down. This is after the surgery. Mm. And he, uh, the day before, or that day before that evening, um, they had taken out the uh, catheter uh, for urine. Yeah. And he... In my in my days, like he he said to me, I'm so sorry to have to tell you. Like he's whispering in my ear, I'm so sorry to have to tell you, mate. But I got we got to put the catheter back in. Oh. So that that, that he had to. I said whatever, you know. I just mm. yeah, go for it. Mm. Um, he, they they put the catheter back in, and then he called doctors, and he had people there, and he had requested all these bloods and all this stuff, and he never got what he wanted back from. The doctors. So the next morning, when I had stabilized and the neurosurgeon, my neurosurgeon was doing the rounds, uh, he was still on shift and she was debriefing, getting a debrief what happened overnight. Yeah. He was giving her the debrief and the doctor, the attending doctor was there as well. And uh, he said, well, she said that my, my neurosurgeon said, where are the blood, where, where, where are all the blood tests and the results? Can I see him? And the nurse looks at her and goes, oh, no, I haven't got them back yet. Like, did you order them? And he goes, yeah, I ordered them from the doctor next to us, you know. <laughs> and my neurosurgeon looks at him and says, where are the blood results that yeah. your nurse requested from you? And he came up with some excuse and she, my neurosurgeon just ripped him another asshole. She just destroyed him <laughs> in front of the nurse, in front of me and everybody. Next time a highly uh, proficient nurse says to you to order something because of the this reason or that reason, do not delay. Do Make it. sure you get those results for that person immediately, mm. et cetera. Mm. So that nurse, I just remember how he treated me, and I don't remember his name. Mm. And I wished that I was able to contact yeah. him and say thank you, yeah. and let them know. But I don't even know which ward I was in. Like I have no memory of anything after brain surgery for quite a while. So I, it's all a, a haze. But I just remember feeling really safe and really cared for by this nurse. Yeah. Um, so I know what you mean. They're, they're very rare and they really make a massive impact on, on you. They do. And um, I think at the time you don't realise. No. Like you, you just, because you, you know, you still, you, you're in shock. Mm. You, you, you know, you're, you're trying to absorb everything that's mm. just happened. Mm. Um, but as time goes on, you start to have those memories and, of the people, and it's it is just, it's really important to have that that support. And even if it's just one or two people, like even mm. if you've got that, you know, hold on to that because there are a lot of people out there that don't have a lot of support. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said at the start, I'm, I'm very grateful. You know, I thought I probably would have had more, um, but that's not the case. But the ones I do, I did have, and I still do, um, you know, forever thankful because, you know, I'm still not very honest with them about how I actually. <laughs> I just still go. I just still keep going. But they probably know. They're probably just like, oh, she's just faking it. <laughs> yeah, they know more than you think. Yeah, I think so. I don't think I give them good, good enough credit. Yeah, but anyway. Um, but well, that's yeah. good. That's good. Um, gratitude really does help with recovery. It, it's it been does. proven that gra- gratitude helps tremendously with healing and recovery yeah. and getting yeah. uh, back on track. So, and I never a- had that prior to the stroke. Gratitude. No, really. Nah. 
when I think about it, I Same. was um, I was like, oh, you know, whatever. Why does this always happen? But now it's different. Yeah, I love it. I love the amount that you've grown. And uh, the conversation that we've had has been really deep, you know, that's really Socratic uh, conversation that we're having here. How, how do you like that? <laughs> yeah, very uh, good. How, how good am I? Uh, and you know what I love? I love that picture of Madonna in your background. Oh, it's not Madonna. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. I don't know who it is. That's Madonna. I got it from, I don't know, finished. Actually, when I'm looking in the, it does look like her. Yeah, a that's twenty-year-old Madonna. It's not her though. Okay, well there it goes. You, you've just learned a little bit more about me and my childhood. <laughs> yeah, well, Madonna. She was one of my faves. Oh my gosh, she's still one of my faves. I don't like the way that she's evolved her face, but other than that, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> she must like it. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, I really appreciate you reaching out and, uh actually then coming to and committing to the next mm. stage, which is being on the podcast and having a chat yeah. about it. Thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. It's um, I, I was very nervous, but uh, no, um, yeah, it was good chat. Yeah. And if and people, I hope are- people listen and listen to them all, like I've just started listening to a lot of them. I'm going to actually go and listen to Antonio's. Yeah. Because you have a lot. 27. What are you up to? 200 and what am I? Two, uh, 200 and... You're going to be 213 or 14 and Antonio's 27. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And if anyone's listening or watching and you're on YouTube, tell me whether or not you think that's Madonna in the background. <laughs> <laughs> if you see what I see. Well. Um, just so I don't... You know, I don't know, just so I can, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, just let me know. But uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks, um, Bill. all the best with your recovery. Yeah. Thank you very much. And to you and to everyone else out there. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. To learn more about my guests, including links to their socials and to download a full transcript of the the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, comment below the video like this episode, click the notifications bell to get future episodes and subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. Sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make it possible for people who may need this type of content to find it easier and that may make a massive difference to someone that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for information purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.